Fantastic. We are recording. Uh, so thank you all for coming out to my little session here. Um, I'm very excited for this. Just on a personal note to start it off. This is my first like in-person Drupal speaking event thing. So thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about accessibility testing tools and then some real world best practices um, and examples of things that I find myself fixing a lot. So yeah. So. Brief agenda for today, we're just going to do a brief introduction of the importance of digital accessibility and then we're going to jump into some automated testing tools, some manual testing steps, and then again, as I said, those common and then a couple more complex accessibility issues and their related remediations. And depending on how fast I talk, we will likely have some time for some questions, answers at the end. Um, I've also got at the bottom left here um, the bit.ly link to the slides. This is just going to be a lot of links to different tools, um, so if you would like to open that up now, I would recommend. It's going to be a lot easier than trying to write down all those links really fast. Some of them are very long. Awesome. So, hello. My name is Fran. Um, I am a technical lead at Northern Commerce. We are a Drupal agency out of Ontario, Canada. Um, a little bit more about me. Just to, you know, make it a little bit more personal here. I have two cats. Those are them, Callie and Ellie. Um, I love to go to concerts. My favorite band is the 1975. Travel, being outdoors, hiking, things, all the things. Um, and yeah, there's my team at Northern. Well, like a third of them. Um, yeah, like them a lot too. Been with Northern for about four years now, working in the accessibility space for about three years of that. Um, so I've had a lot of experience in different projects and working with different teams, being designers, developers, project managers, um, working through the whole accessibility <coughs> process. So yeah, let's dive into it, shall we? So first off, let's talk about the importance of digital accessibility and why we need to make our sites accessible. Simply put, the humanity of it. Um, it sounds so simple, but it's just something that we always need to remind ourselves that it may be easier to do something one way, but at the end of the day, our websites, our products, whatever we are creating, are for a human. And we want to make sure that everyone has the ability to use our site, use our products, um, in the way that works for them. Next up, the numbers. Um, about 2 billion people globally identify with having some sort of disability. Um, that's nearly one in every five people. Uh, and then also we need to consider people with disabilities that might not be um, something that they're living with all the time. So it could be a temporary disability or a situational disability. On the side of the screen here, I have a couple examples just to get your mind thinking of um, these different scenarios. So if we look at the hearing line here, um, of course, you think about someone with a permanent hearing disability, you'll think of someone who is deaf. Um, a temporary hearing disability could be someone with an ear infection. And then situational could be a bartender or someone in a loud environment. Um, in all of these situations, the person is not going to be able to hear what is coming from their device or whatever software they are using. Um, yeah, they'll either be able not to hear it at all or just barely. So these are situations where we need to be thinking about how we are presenting content. Um, next up is, of course, the law. I will preface this by saying I am in no way a lawyer, uh, maybe the farthest thing from it. So I'm not going to stand here and <laughs> try to preach to you about the law. Hopefully, um, if you are in the accessibility space, you can take some time to research the local laws of where you're from, where your clients are from, so on and so forth. Um, again, as I said, I'm from Ontario. We have the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, which was passed in 2005. You guys here in the States were much more ahead of it than us. So, shout it to you. <laughs> So this is probably going to be my biggest takeaway from this whole presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking to you a lot about different tools that I use, how I work with things. Um, but it is so important at the end of the day that you are always involving people with disabilities in your testing, um, in your development, the whole stage of the process. There's only so much that we can do. I can do the reading, I can follow all the steps, do all the research, but at the end of the day it is not the same as having someone who is using these assistive technologies, using the softwares that we're working with, who are living with the disabilities every day. So yes, keep this in mind as I go through this whole process. So, 
let's jump into some automated testing tools. This is where we're going to get through all the links and hopefully you find some new tools that you can test out and try. So first we're going to preface this by automated testing tools are super helpful ways to run through and catch um, high level issues. They're mainly going to be catching semantic issues, issues with HTML, um, they're automated tools. I'm sure you've all heard it a bunch that they're a great first step. Um, we have a bunch of different kinds of automated tools starting here are probably the most popular I think if you have heard of any you have heard of one at least one of these. So first up is Axe which is by DeQ. This is a browser plugin that's just going to let you test a single page or component and then same idea with Wave. It's going to run through all the automated issues, present them to you nicely on the specific page that you're in. Oh, and then of course Lighthouse, this just ships with Chrome right in the dev tools. Um, so yeah, all these are just kind of like one-off situations. They're great for working like while you're developing, finding developers in the room. Um, so while you're working, just a single click of the button, it'll run the test and you can check it out. Next up, we have some more comprehensive automated tools. So these are tools that are going to be able to um, scan through your entire site um, I work with a lot of sites that are higher education, so we have a whole bunch of pages. And I do not want to spend hours and hours and hours going through page by page by page. Um, I'm sure a lot of you in the room can relate to that. <laughs> so these tools are great for that. Um, some of these as well, you can, even, you can even set up user flows. So if you have any interactive elements, multi-page forms, things, things like that, where you want to follow through a process, um, you can go through, set up the user journey, clicking through everything like that. Um, I will say these are all paid tools that I have listed here. Most of the comprehensive automated tools like this are going to be paid services. Um, these are the ones that I have worked with and enjoyed. If you want more details, pros and cons of each, I could talk about that all day, but I don't want to waste your time. <laughs> so if you have any specific questions about any of these or, um, yeah wanted to get an inside look, I am happy to chat with any of you afterwards about the specific tools and give you a demo and such. Um, yes, and then the usual automated testing tools are not great. <laughs> we are here, as I said um, a couple slides ago, we need to make sure that we are making our sites work for human beings. So if we are having these machines test our sites, They'll do what they can, but at the end of the day, they are just a machine. They are not a human. So we need to do manual testing. <laughs> so what does manual testing look like? Um, here I've just dumped some questions that run through my mind when I am starting a manual test of a site. Um, this by no means is a comprehensive list. This is just you know the first things that I'm running through as I am testing things on the fly and things like that. Um, so just running through the list quickly, can you, can you successfully navigate an action, all functionality with a keyboard? Can you tell where the focus is as you're moving through the site? Um, can you successfully navigate with a screen reader? Hopefully. Uh, will the site still function when you zoom in? What about zoom out? Nothing being cut off, everything's all good. Um, what about skip the main link? Does that exist? I find that's something that gets missed a lot. Um, so making sure that the user can skip over all the repeated content, usually in the header. Um, and then our usual co color contrast, making sure there's no empty links. We're going cross this one a lot um, with like mobile functionality, so like your hamburger menu icon, your search toggle icon, things like that. It's easy just to go in there and, hey, I'm just going to throw an icon on this button, throw some JavaScript at it. But you need to make sure you have some actual words in there for those that are not visual. Um, and then yeah, semantic HTML, and then all of our favorites, the alt attribute, making sure those make sense, um, whether they are need to be a full alt description, or if they're decorative, make it empty. Yeah, yeah. So diving in a little bit deeper to some specific steps of manual testing, the first thing I usually like to do is keyboard testing. This is one of the easiest things for me. Usually run this through as I'm developing things, just simply Throw away your mouse. Don't literally throw it away. I would, <laughs> um, you know, put it to the side. Maybe unplug it and make sure that you can access everything. You can function everything. Everything works using only your keyboard. And also making sure that you can follow all the interactive content on the screen using only your keyboard. 
So when you're tabbing through the site, making sure that it's not jumping from the top to the bottom or, you know, out of a way that would be confusing. Um, yep, and then last one there is keyboard traps. Uh, so this comes up a lot with any like custom modals or pop-ups, things like that. Um, sometimes the close button is simply tied to the click or just like does it exist. Um, and then, so if you're a user not using a mouse that's able to click out into the gray area, you're kind of screwed because <laughs> you're stuck in that modal and all you have left to do is refresh the page and then go through all the content and that sounds super annoying. So let's avoid that. Next up we have screen readers. Um, most common, most popular are JAWS and NVDA. Um, I put a couple graphs on the side here of some interesting things. Um, so the top one on the right here, the pie chart, we can see that JAWS is the most popular by, this was from 2021 by WebAIM. 53% um, of people that they surveyed reported using JAWS, um, whereas that's 30.7 on NVDA, and then 6.5 voiceover and so on and so forth. I want to point your attention to this graph in the bottom left. Uh, that is the right, not the left. <laughs> um, so something super interesting, of course, JAWS has always been the most popular. Um, it was one of the biggest first screen readers out there. Great tool for a lot of people. Of course, it is a paid tool that's pretty expensive. Um, so NVDA came out. Free screen reader. You know, it's still developing, people are getting used, people are using it more and more. You can see here JAWS in the blue line is decreasing over the years. Um, and then NVDA increasing, you know, makes sense, free tool, it's working, they're a competitor. Something super strange last year, I have no rhyme or reason why this would have happened. If anyone has any idea, I would love to know your thoughts as to why maybe. Um, JAWS is back up. After 10 years of decreasing in popularity and NVDA increasing, it kind of just like flipped back and now JAWS is more popular again and NVDA is less. Um, I bring this to your attention basically just to say, make sure that you're not just testing with one tool, one browser, one situation. Um, you can't just assume that your users are going to be using one assistive technology with one certain browser, with the newest operating system. You need to make sure that you are testing on a wide variety of scenarios. And something I use to make that a lot easier in my day to day is this tool called Assistive Labs. Um, again, this is a paid tool. I don't know if I said this at the top. I am not sponsored by any of these people. I have no affiliation. <laughs> So this is a um, screen reader emulator, works really well, it lets you choose between the dis different assistive technologies. The ones I use most commonly are NVDA, JAWS, and VoiceOver. <coughs> it also lets you choose between the different versions of that assistive technology, and then also the different browsers you can um, render it on as well. So this is great for Firefox, Chrome, even Internet Explorer, crazy, I know. Um, and then that different browser version as well. So this is just kind of like your one-stop shop of here, I'm going to run all of my tests right here, right now. Don't need to worry about opening different browsers and softwares and all that. Just create one stop shop. And of course, contrast checker tools. I'm sure everyone's got a favorite one of these. Um, there are so many out there, a lot of really great ones. But I'm just going to highlight a couple of my favorites that I use on the daily. The contrast checker tools. First one is from WebAIM, which is pictured in the top right here. Real simple UI, toss in your foreground color, toss in your background color, spits up the contrast ratio. Um, there's even a slider there. You can change the lightness slightly. If you need to make it slightly lighter, slightly darker. Um, just don't get in trouble with your designers if <laughs> you change your color. Um, that does not make them happy often. Um, one other thing I really like about the WebM contrast checker is that they also have a link checker associated with that as well. So you can throw in your body text color, your link text color, and your background color and make sure all three of those check out with each other. Next up is contrast-ratio.com. This one is great for testing out um, colors that have transparency to them. So you can throw in your CSS values there, so like your um, RGBA, your HSLAs, all those guys, and test them there. And then these bottom two are the grid style, so this is where you can throw in your whole color palette and see at a glance uh, what's going to work together, what's not going to work together. Um, this is what I have the screenshot here on the right with. These tools I really love using um, in the initial phase of a project with the design team so that they can see 
everything that we're working with. But then also with situations where we have clients, content editors working in the system that are able to, let's say if we're using like components, layout builder, all that, um, if the editor has the option to customize blocks on the page um, and maybe select a background color, change content in WYSIWYG, that kind of stuff, it's really important that they know what combos can and can't work together as much as we try to restrict what they can do so they don't mess it up. Um, so having this as a visual is just a quick reference of, hey, here what works and what doesn't work together. You've got them highlighted in the bright red. Um, yeah. And just another one here, a quick one, is heading map. Again, this is another Chrome plugin. One click of a button will show you the whole heading structure of the page. I really like this one specifically because it filters out all of the hidden titles. Um, so anything that is like display none that your screen reader is not going to pick up on anyway. Um, it will remove it from the list. So that's great. And finally, just a couple additional resources here um, that I find helpful. First one is a checklist from DeQ. Second one is a checklist from WebAIM. If you're feeling like accessibility audits, where do I start? I am overwhelmed. There is so much to do and that is like completely fair. Um, this is where I kind of got my start of, hey, here's a list of things that I should be checking. It really just like gets your brain working and thinking and it's a nice intro to auditing <laughs> sites for accessibility in general. Um, and then same thing for the web.dev blog there on how to do an accessibility review. Um, just a step-by-step, -step, simple introduction to it all. Um, of course, these are starting steps. I would use these as inspiration. Again, just like with our automated tools, same idea here. This is not the be-all, end-all. I am a firm believer that there's never going to be like one set checklist that is like, hey, fill out this whole checklist and your site's accessible. Um, so much of accessibility comes down to context and, you know, being a human, how we as humans are interacting with and interpreting the different product. So, yeah, take this with a grain of salt, use it, it's great, and then keep going from there. Awesome. So that was me rambling with all of those links. <laughs> now let's get into a couple of specific examples of issues that I run into on so many sites, things that I fix so often, um, and then just how we fix those. Um, so starting off with some simple common ones, headings orders, heading order, of course. Um, our blocks by default are mostly going to be rendering with H2s. This is great if you are working on something super simple. Um, I have a lot of situations where we have the client is in there using layout builder, components, paragraphs, things like that to create blocks right in the layout, because it changes page to page. So we can't just say, hey, this block is going to always render with an H2. That's going to be a mess. Either our whole site's going to be an H1 and all H2s, or everything's going to be out of order, the whole thing. Um, so we have a couple different options here. Again, if it's like a static block or replacing the block layout, Generally, I'll go in and just override the template and change that to whatever heading level works. But something else that we've been doing a lot recently um, for those more customizable layouts with layout builder and such is actually giving an option for the editor to select what heading level. Of course, this requires some training for the editor side. Um, so depending on how competent they are, um, having an extra field that will dynamically render what heading level is placed on the page for that specific block context is super helpful. Okay, next up is keyboard only. So again, making sure that we are not writing any custom JavaScript that is going to rely on someone to be using a mouse. So not relying on the click function. Um, we can do that just by calling out which key we're pressing on, 1332, for the enter or the space bar. And yeah, simple as that. This is hopefully something that you would catch if you are doing that keyboard testing. Next up, related to keyboard testing, is the focus control. Um, so this comes up in a couple different scenarios. Um, one scenario that I run into a lot is with facets. So if you have a view that is reloading with Ajax and facets, because the view is going to actually rebuild those facets, the focus is lost. And so anyone that is using a keyboard only or a lot of assistive technologies, they're going to select an item from the facet. Page is going to reload. The focus is way back at the top of the page. 
So then they're going to have to go through all of your page again, maybe if they want to select another facet. Oh no, they got to do this all again. This is a really frustrating process. So we want to make sure that we are um, being, we are taking action and taking control over where the focus is going and making sure that it is always a seamless experience. Um, next up, again, if we think about Fuse, Ajax, things dynamically changing on the page, we want to let users know. Um, for a lot of us, if we are, again, I'll use the view, um, like search view, Ajax facets, and if we select something and the content automatically updates, great, me, myself, I can see that. Um, a lot of people can't. So if they are using a screen reader or other assistive technologies, we can utilize the ARIA Live attribute, which will notify um, the assistive technology whenever this element changes. <clears throat> so in this scenario, you update the facet and the number of search results changes to 20 results found. Great, something as simple as that will let the user know that, hey, this search was successful, what I did took action, I'm gonna go check out the content now. Great, so those were a couple quick, easy ones. Um, now let's jump into two more complex things that have a bit more functionality that we run into all the time. First, accordions. We love accordions. <laughs> so um, there's a couple different ways we can do accordions. This specific example is for custom accordion markup. Um, of course, you can use the native HTML um, details and summary accordions, but for this example, we're doing custom stuff. So we can utilize the ARIA attributes to communicate to the user what the functionality is and what the state of our accordions are. Um, you can see here, we're gonna make sure we're using semantic markup, using a button element, and then we've got a unique ID, the ARIA expanded attribute. Uh, this is something that's gonna communicate to the user. You guessed it, if the accordion is expanded or not. Uh, and that's going to toggle between true and false, given the state. And then the ARIA controls is what connects the actual trigger to the content. Um, this is something that I believe right now only works in JAWS. Um, so maybe that's one of the reasons that JAWS is back being more popular, because they have a little bit more functionality. Um, so yes, in JAWS that lets the user jump between the trigger and the content um, super quickly. And then back on the content here, of course, we have the ID to connect to the ARIA controls from the button. And then we have the ARIA labeled by, which will simply um, tell the user what this content is labeled by. And that is linked, of course, to the trigger. And similarly, we have tabs. Tabs are a bit more complex, um, but there's a lot of um, of the same attributes and systems that we see with the accordions. So again, that semantic markup, making sure that we are using buttons and our unique IDs, roles. We have a specific role of tab here. And then for all of our tabs, wrappers, we've got that role of tab list. Um, that's gonna notify the user when they get to this element um, to know that, hey, this is gonna be a set of tabs. You're gonna have to do some interacting here to see the content. And then, of course, the individual tabs have the role of tab. And again, on the individual tabs, on the accordions, remember we had ARIA expanded. These guys, we have ARIA selected. Same idea, you're gonna toggle it between true and false depending on which tab is open. And again, ARIA controls, of course, linking the trigger to the content. And the content in this case is called a tab panel. Uh, we have a specific role for that. And then here we're using the ARIA labeled by attribute again. And here's some custom functionality that we can use for tabs. Um, this, of course, isn't the single source of truth of you have to do this for tabs. This is kind of like the above and beyond, like, wow, your tabs have so much functionality. I can navigate them in so many ways. Um, <laughs> so of course, by default, we just want to make sure that they can be opened and closed and toggled and that they function, um, in this case, on enter or on space, and then, of course, on click. In this example that I've outlined here, the tab panel, so the whole, or the tab list, I should say, so the group of all of the tab triggers, that is what receives focus. And then to navigate between the individual tab items, the user will use the left and right arrows, and then you can quickly jump to the first one or the last one using the home or the end key. Great, um, so I think 
feel like I talked really fast there, but this is basically the end of it. Um, yeah, I hope you got something out of this today. Maybe a new tool that you're going to try. Maybe something new that you are going to test. Um, thank you for being here. The fact that you are here today means a lot. Um, appreciate you all going on this accessibility journey and making the web a better place. That was so cheesy. <laughs> Um, yeah, so again, there's the bit.ly link if anyone wants to grab the slides, feel free to chat with me wherever. I love talking about accessibility. LinkedIn's there as well. Um, but yeah, do we have any questions? Oh, hey, sorry, yes. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, so, I'm a project manager, right? So the only thing that I can do is make sure that this is something that we're looking at in general. Um, what do you, what would you say or do you have any tips for a client or team who says, well, we've done our accessibility checks because I ran it through site improve <laughs> and the score is good enough. So we're done, yeah. like check mark. Um, since it seems like that is not sufficient, what is, how do you have that conversation or what would you bring up? That conversation at the end of the day just comes down to emphasizing empathy. Um, that was a good alliteration there. I'm gonna use that. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just reiterating over and over, and as I said, this conversation I've had so many times with basically every client is like, cool, yes, you see this number that's either gonna be good or bad from this automated scan, but just being really honest with them, like, hey, that's simply an automated scan, that's a machine, like, that does not guarantee that that's actually gonna work for your students. You could focus on, I don't know, depending on the client, you're the project manager, you're gonna know them best, like, if it's gonna be the empathy route, if it's gonna be the money route, you know, like, I don't like to focus on that, but <laughs> oh yeah, literally, like, hey, no, that's kind of a lie. Trust me, you could get sued. Trust me, you're going to be losing out on money because, what, you only want able bodied people to be able to buy from you? That sucks. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Does that answer that? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, in my experience as a front end developer in uh, agency life, yes. uh, the only way to make sure that accessibility is still on the radar, it, it, and maybe there's other ways. The only way that I've seen is to keep talking about it and yep. keep sharing knowledge. What does that look like in your work? How do you keep sharing knowledge with each other? Yeah, that's tough. Um, I definitely run into that same thing a lot. Sometimes it's easy to get in the boat of like, I don't know, I feel like I'm like speaking to an empty room or mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm reiterating the same things and that can definitely be frustrating. Um, I think first step is something that I have really worked on over the past couple of years is like just being so, I don't know, just so upfront with management specifically, like starting right at the top and being like, hey, this is like super important. You may not see it, but you need to trust me. And like, they might think you're annoying as hell, but like <laughs> they, they definitely have been annoyed at me at times. Yeah. Um, but just like being at them, every instance of it, like, hey, hey, I noticed we just launched this site on this thing. Yeah. Who was looped in on this? What happened? Like, I think we should be sending out a better product. All that kind of stuff. Um, and then on the more like, you know, you and I level, yeah. it, along the developers, um, I do like, we do like lunchtime sessions where we'll like go over new things. We've got a Slack channel where like, I don't know, I'm just like posting there all the time of like, hey, I found out this today, cool. Or I don't know, sometimes even just to like get people engaged and like, hey, what are your guys' thoughts on this? Like. We have a lot of conversations about, I don't know, common things like, I think the last thing we talked about in there was the rule about um, color contrast on disabled form elements. I don't know, it goes back and forth. It's like, of course it's disabled, so I guess technically it doesn't really need to meet the contrast thing, but I, don't know, I think just getting people engaged. Um, a lot of people on our end are intimidated by it, I'd say. They're like, this is a whole thing that I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. Um, I don't know. So I like doing things like this, just like, putting a single thing in front of you, like those checklists, and being like, start here. Mm -hmm. Cool, let's, let's make this a little bit more digestible. Mm -hmm. Or like, hey, I'm gonna get you started and just check all the color contrast. And then we'll walk through the rest. But like, you know, dip in the toes in. Yeah, sounds yeah. like it's basically a, like a full-time job. It's a full-time job. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. No problem. <laughs> yes. Um, let me give you an example first, and then I'll ask my question. Please. So, Please. Uh, a while back, big uh, U.S. government site. I come in at the end, check accessibility. It 
essentially the the at the end of the process they had contrast issues and focusability issues both yep the both uh solutions you have a style guide here that we're supposed to do you have accessibility law over here that we're supposed to do you get to choose one yep and yeah it's late <laughs> so the question i have is getting uh this process started as early as possible mm -hmm. at a mock-up level is you know yep. run through the automated thing almost before you get to anything else yep so that it's not perfect it's going to change it's not going to have everything but getting the visibility to the mm -hmm. front side uh the the designer people earlier any mm -hmm. direction on on making yeah it early enough in the process to get the party started get the party started i love that <laughs> Um, I think again, it really just comes down to like inserting yourself in the process right. and being assertive about it. Like, be confident in yourself. Like, right. you know, this is something we need to be doing. And if they don't see it, that's I don't know. As someone who knows, it's kind of our job to communicate it with them. Right. Um, yeah. As far as like getting it through the designers and stuff, again, just like making those connections, even like outside of the project with the designer, being like, hey. Um, is this part of your process or like we use Figma sketch a lot and being like yeah oh hey it kind of feels like I it was... should be on them all yes. more than sometimes we the... need to spoon feed them yes um, yeah. there's a, there's a bunch of like plugins and stuff for Figma and sketch and stuff so I'm like hey have you tried this out yet like I don't have sketch on my computer can you test this out right. um, sometimes I've had to play dumb like that it really depends on the person of like <laughs> yeah. anything to get it in front of them um, to make it easier yeah. for them and to make it be a, exactly some sort of just have you done just the bare minimum yeah yeah some people get you. i think i think it's also kind of what you were saying before you start up with leadership and you make sure that they know especially as a government organization that are mandated by congress to be accessible and um I have to say, sometimes it's carrot, sometimes it's a stick of like, hey, <laughs> yeah. one, for my group, we don't build things that aren't accessible. We can't. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't get sued. So we've had to sit down with clients and go, this is, you, we can't launch your site. There's too many accessibility issues, and they'll open you up to lawsuits. If they don't get the, hey, this is humanity. And <laughs> exactly. Empathy, sometimes you got to threaten them a little bit. Think about people. <laughs> Just to, yeah. Uh, lecturing about VPAT and, and like what happens when something goes wrong until they have suffered so much that they just do the contract. Yeah. Or send them a couple articles about how people have gotten sued. So oh, yeah. yeah. Those, Those are always fun. Make them listen. Do you want to spend the money meeting? now or you want to spend $100,000 later? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Yeah, because you have the bad. I would have to think there's bad actors out there looking for cover. There absolutely is. Yeah. There's definitely like specific companies that their whole job is just. You know, running these um, automated scans on sites and being like, oh, here's a random issue. I'm going to file a lawsuit against you now. Hey, give me your money. Um, it sucks. I don't like that at all. But, you know, people, Go capitalism. Not helping. Jordan. Uh, and just to add to the conversation, too, of, on how to get, like, teams on, on to doing it, it's like, I know we have this whole thing about, like, mobile first, but it's also should be accessibility first as well. So, like, yeah. why... Mm -hmm. Do it at the end when you could be doing it while you're building the elements so that you're not like going at the end and saying oh the whole site's unaccessible and we have a week to launch um right. and i find that it helps too like uh, at least our process is we have we've implemented like accessibility scans along the way of development so like you know say we're part way we do an initial scan see where we're, where we're lacking try to fix it do another one before launch, even do one after launch to make sure that we, like, you know, if we didn't catch everything, we can kind of fix all the other bits. But really, like, putting that in the process of, of creating the, the site is really important as well. And then everyone's kind of on the same page and, and yeah, really driving it home. So, awesome. another thing, we've done this where we've actually brought our developers and other mm -hmm. stakeholders into a meeting where we brought in somebody who uses the system technology mm, and have them try to use the site. Recently we've done that with our HR site. Well, we built in a lot of accessibility ourselves. 
we had a whole group come in and one of them was um, had sight problems. He used assistive technology and be able to sit down with somebody and see what they have to go through. It's, it, you want empathy, there's empathy. So, For real. Well, the, the thing I will say, since that project and the, uh, you make a choice and they're big choices, um, it feels like this is just a piece similar to semantic <coughs> markup, that similar to the SEO lever has helped. Mm -hmm. it, it may, if you do the right thing early, in general, we get two thirds of the way, it's gonna service all these other values that you want at the same time. So that's kind of the carrot. It makes it more SEO friendly if you have alt text. Exactly. All those Proper kind of really simple all of it. things have those helped. Are, those are the major things we normally see is alt tags, color contrast, right. and not using semantic markup. Right. Mm -hmm. Or using it wrong. Yeah, back then. Do you know of any tools or plugins that can be used with CK editors so that content editors are getting on the spot alerts that on for things yes. like you yeah. just went from an H2 to an H5, for example, those types of Oh, no, yeah, there is one right now. I forget what the name of it is off the top of my head. Jordan, do you know? Uh, I think it's called. I was like, we've got I it all over. So editorially, sites. but like yeah, the end editorial a one one y. Yeah, um, and it, it kind of yeah. does like a scan. I, there's one of them. I think that's the one that like is in the WYSIWYG, and it'll tell you like yeah. what the errors are. It also tell you on like the bottom corner of like a like a page, and then just tell them like right up after they save the notes. Like, yep, this is wrong. I need you to fix it. Okay. So it's very clear to them, like, what is that. there. It, it does require them to click the button. Though. Yeah, I mean, so. they have to be <laughs> There's a little bit of aware, pressing. To... It'll, like, kind of be in their face of, like, oh, I want to get rid of this warning here. Maybe I should fix my header. Yeah. Well, and it kind of feels like, I would throw this out there, and this is a question for the group, maybe. Mm -hmm. It sort of feels like there's a piece of this that could be related to CICD. So if you have BHAT, it takes picture. Mm -hmm. And you have result, it's, you just did a build, thing comes up, now you're abjectly failing. You know, or just, just even some hints. It, it feels like those, that, that part of the process could be, it's not gonna solve, but maybe it raises its hand and says, there's something there. Yeah, I feel like at the end of the day, that's like really it. Like, even if the person specifically who sees that there is an issue, even if they're not able to like comprehend it, understand it completely, like that's fine, but being available and having like like a Slack channel or whatever open for people to have that open discussion of, hey, what does this error mean? Or it's should I be checking like this? There should be, a, there should be some sort of scripting. Yeah. Fire off one of these tools. How bad are we? Something happened. And that's it. Um, yeah, what's going on? I was going to make a recommendation for this conversation here. Mm -hmm. There's um, Xcore. You can they have a plugin for Playwright. So if you're using Playwright for your VR testing, you can easily run accessibility tests um, in the same test suite. Yeah, I think all the access tools are really good. Um, I don't know if all you guys were in an on um, session yesterday. She was going over the um, inline in ID tool that they are developing now. Um, I was sitting in a session with it earlier last month um, from DeQ, and it seems like it's going to be pretty good. Um, essentially, it's like automated scan built right in as you're writing the code. It'll flag things. Um, there's still some limitations with it right now, so it's not really in here because I haven't had much experience with it, mainly because I use PHP Storm. It's not available on JetBrains or anything like that yet, um, and then there is still some limitations with like what kind of files it can test. Um, like Are there tools yet? for app builders. I'm not sure. Because it feels I'm like sure everybody, so. you know, I gotta have an app for that, which is yeah. a whole nother discussion. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it kind of feels like there should be something in that world is that explodes and eventually hopefully dies. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would really hope so, but I don't know. Don't have a good answer for you there. All right. I have a question. So, um, like, I know our devs and engineers do the best they can to, like, pick up on a lot of this stuff, but some of what you're talking about, about manual testing and, like, the benefit of having someone who actually has, um, is differently abled using that. Like, are there any services or companies that, like, 
allow you to contract with them to get people because like we don't have like an endless pool of people internally who um, are differently abled and would be able to test it. So like where yeah. do I go to, to find some people who could? Yeah, it feels like there's <laughs> there. a business opportunity. There's something. Yeah, there's, there there is. Is. definitely is a lot of companies like that. Um, I would flag to you to do your research and definitely get some examples from them. Um, some of our clients work with those other companies as well, which like all the respect to it, like more people with eyes on it, it's going to be a better product. Um, but there have been some definitely questionable things that, you know, that come out of these companies. So I'd make sure you do your research. Um, I don't know, kind of a funny story recently, but I'm fighting with one of those companies right now. I don't even know their name, so I can't talk smack about them even if I wanted to. Um, <laughs> are fighting with me about um, making sure the page looks aesthetically pleasing when CSS is disabled. Basically, they want me to make everything in tables in the markup when CSS is disabled, but then not in tables because they understand that that's not really the best for accessibility when CSS isn't disabled. I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, are we in 2000, like, one right now? Who's disabling CSS? <laughs> like, yeah, who even knows how to disable CSS? Yeah, like, Chrome, even, you have to install a plugin to because disable it. Like, it's good semantic markup. I mean, exactly. Like, it's semantic? Cool. I get the whole premise of it. CSS. Yeah. Um, DQ does this. Yeah. DQ, oh, yeah? DQ has teams of people that's who are awesome. differently able. Yeah, the same, the same company that you just said is awesome. We love DQ so much. Yeah, I love them, too. I love them, too. Yeah, but we worked with them before and had yeah. really great experiences, shockingly. Yeah. But, yeah, DQ. So yeah. it's possible to contract with them? Yes. Like, yeah. From like initial yes. like build. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're super easy to work with, lovely. And I mean I I would have thought that it would be wildly expensive too, but I mean mm -hmm. that's subjective and relative, but yeah, I mean, we do in a lot the of context our... of a, a three hundred thousand dollar build, I didn't think it was actually that expensive to have <laughs> them come in and take a look at things. So well, yeah. I mean, less DQ. expensive than getting sued. Ding ding ding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <It usually> yeah. <laughs> yeah. DQ's also got um early grade training program. Um if you have like developers, designers, project managers, QA testers, basically anyone um that has no idea anything about accessibility, they've got a lot of really good courses. Um that I personally have taken that we now have integrated into our company as would as part of our onboarding process for everyone. Um, so yeah, I would recommend that as well. Probably a little tricky as we work towards a model that's more component based. Mm -hmm. So you're, I'm building a little piece of thing. Yep. If it could be any stack of them. Yep. Yep. That's mm -hmm. probably a. a yeah, most of our components these days have right. like so many fields of like like I mentioned earlier like. You have to select what heading level and right. all those flags about like, hey, if you're using this background color and then if in the WYSIWYG you're choosing the primary button and if those clash, then you have to add all this extra CSS to like maybe change it and it's a lot. The more dynamic we get. We had one project building a header component mm -hmm. that stripped out the normal H1 tag. Oh. Okay. Okay. Fine. Why? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah, because why did you, exactly. <laughs> I'm a little lost, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Why'd you do that? Yeah. Well, it seemed like the right thing to do. Okay, <laughs> fine. Whatever. Cool. Anyone else? Questions, comments, concerns? Cool. Oh, Jordan, one more. Uh, Take what, us home. What voice do you use for the voiceover? <laughs> uh, we were talking this morning. Um, you, can, you can change the voiceover voice. Personally, I like to use Daniel. He is the man from the UK. Um, he's got a very nice British accent. <laughs> How fast does Daniel talk? Um, personally, I only have Daniel set at like 60%. Oh. Have you ever heard like someone who uses a screen reader full time? I can. Oh my god. It's yeah. amazing. I'm yeah. like, how are you comprehending all of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I usually go fast enough that my friends who don't do any accessibility yeah. testing lose their minds, but like it's still half as fast as people who use screen readers every day. It's wild. Exactly. So do they have a Snoop Dogg plug in now? So <laughs> No, oh, no. Really? Ah. In voiceover? No. Oh, but, but now that you have all of these all of these plugins for Waze and all these other mapping things, one plugins for that stuff could conceptually be. Yeah, I think they did the Cookie Monster, so right? that, that would Absolutely. be a great one. Right? Be like, yo man, that's a tab. That's another tab. <laughs>
Okay. Yeah, I want I want a, an accessibility Make like voiceover fun. tool that gives me a hard time that really like razzes me like, hey, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> just gets on your case about what it. What are you doing? Have you even heard of Aria attributes? Like, come on, come on. Well, if they could make it a little more fun, yeah. you know, by it, you, yeah. maybe you get more people helping. I think that would be like the Karen voiceover. The Karen voiceover. Karen, to I need to talk to your manager. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> April 1st, you Thank you guys. <laughs> Appreciate you all. <laughs>